Hello and welcome to this video on supply chains as a system. Viewing a supply chain as a system allows us to better understand how a supply chain functions within the context of a larger system. During the first part of the video, I will briefly describe what a supply chain system is. I will then follow that up with a description of the Demian Supply Chain Systems model, where I will go into more detail in the interactions of the supply chain, especially within the context of what we call the development chain and the supply chain. I will then discuss the key concepts of lead time and demand, and then I will briefly discuss the challenges that a supply chain faces when trying to optimize a supply chain. A supply chain is defined as an integration of suppliers, manufacturers, warehouses and stores that are designed to produce and move merchandise at the right quantities to the right location at the right time. These factors lend to the fact that the performance of many supply chains are measured based upon time, cost, and quality. The main measurement used for measuring time performance is lead time. Cost metrics focus mainly on product production costs. These are reflected in material and labor costs and logistical costs associated with the transportation and storage of inventory and storage costs. Quality metrics tend to focus on how the supply chain meets customer needs, wants, and expectations by focusing on reducing variability in lead time while improving demand forecasting accuracy. A fundamental theory within lean systems argue that reducing lead time as low as possible allows for more accurate demand forecasting by reducing the span of time required for a forecast to cover. Here is the Damien system model modified to reflect the role of a supply chain. When looking at the supply chain as a system, we begin with the customer wants, needs, and expectations as noted in idea or step zero. These customer factors are then conceptualized into a product which in turn begins the processes of designing the product and sourcing the materials required for the product to be manufactured in what we call the development chain. The development chain, as is explained in Chapter 1 of the textbook, closes the loop in this system by providing for the designing and coordinating of the development of a new product. The development chain is also responsible for improving a product once a product has been designed and input has been received by the customer. In a closed loop system, defined as a system which receives feedback in a closed loop fashion, this occurs whenever the customer provides feedback about how the product meets these core requirements. Once the sourcing is completed, the manufacturing function places orders with the supplier who then procures the required materials for the manufacturer. The product is produced and then is provided to a distributor who provides a logistical function. Logistics in this manner is defined as the role of transporting products to where they are required. The distributor provides the product to the retailer who then makes it available for product purchase by the customer. Supply chains work in conjunction with manufacturing to determine both how much of a product to make, when it needs to be available, and where it is needed. This is typically done through various types of contracts which explicitly state these factors and, and such things as how the cost will be borne and profit sharing arrangements. Note that in some cases the role of distributor may be formed by the retailer. There may also be cases in which the roles of distributor or retailer may be taken by the manufacturer. Just remember that not all supply chains will have distinct entities performing these roles. Rather, these are meant to be roles required to be performed within the supply chain and can be performed mostly by anybody within the supply chain. As suggested by the image, the development chain, which includes functions essential to the planning, designing, and sourcing of a product, has an impact on the supply chain as it influences how a product is produced. The way that a product is designed and produced can have a significant impact on how the supply chain is able to manufacture and distribute the product to the customer by affecting the options a supply chain can take. For example, principles of postponement requires the development chain to design a product using what we call modular construction. Although principles of postponement are not discussed in the textbook, I will provide further detail on this later in the class. Please feel free to refer to the video that I have created on this subject if you are curious about this concept. Lead time and demand are the two main factors used in monitoring the health of a supply chain. In a perfect world, lead time and demand are such that just the right amount of the product is provided to the customer when it is demanded. Although it may not be possible to have zero lead time, there are strategies such as 
risk pooling and safety stock, which provides a means to reduce the amount of inventory kept inside the supply chain to address unwanted demand. Lead time is generally measured from the time an order is made by the customer to the time that the order is fulfilled, although it is not uncommon for each entity within the supply chain to have their own ways of measuring lead time. Demand within the supply chain is usually met using demand forecasting. In an ideal world, supply should equal demand, but due to lags and variation in demand forecasts and variation in lead times, this is rarely the case. Even when using a just-in-time supply chain strategy, in which the product is manufactured and available only when the demand is made, there may be instances in which additional inventory may be required. Sometimes it may even be less costly to have excess inventory available than to risk shortages in a product, especially in critical products in which the cost of not having the product exceeds the cost of excess product. Although in some cases this may result in a type of shifted burden in which the cost felt by the one in control of the inventory may be less than that of the actual customer. In these cases it may be required for the supply chain to involve the customer in inventory decisions as much and as soon as feasibly possible. Supply chains usually have to compromise between a complex and flexible supply chain with increased cost and a simple and rigid supply chain with lower costs. More complex supply chains are better to able to absorb variation within the supply chain. For example, having multiple distribution legs can allow for products to be rerouted effectively in the event of a weather-related event, but this will increase costs, in some cases significantly. Simpler supply chains with fewer nodes to distribute products typically cost less than more complex supply chains but are less capable of absorbing supply chain variation. Customer service level is sometimes used within supply chain calculations to determine the amount of risk that a supply chain is willing to take. I will not go into it in any detail during this video, but please feel free to refer to the video that I've created previously for more information. In general, we use customer service level as a percentage of customers that we are going to try to provide a product for. A higher customer service level means we will attempt to meet more customer demand which will unfortunately result in a higher cost whereas a smaller customer service level may be less costly but stands a risk of having fewer customers have their demands met. There are several challenges that a supply chain faces when trying to optimize a supply chain. Number one, it can be very difficult, if not impossible, to match supply and demand. As mentioned earlier, the goal of a supply chain is to optimize its operations by matching what is made with what is sold. This is made difficult due to the fact that demand can vary widely, which in turn influences the accuracy of demand forecasts, and lead times to fulfill an order can fluctuate widely as well especially when considering extraordinary events such as weather that can disrupt manufacturing and shipping of a product. Number two, inventory and back order levels can fluctuate considerably across the supply chain. During extreme instances, the demand felt across the supply chain can vary widely, especially in supply chains that lack coordination between functions. Delays in inventory shipments and the reporting of these inventories can cause further fluctuations that can result in more product being manufactured, sometimes even less products manufactured than actually required. This is a major reason why lean supply chains mainly focus on reducing lead time. Number three, forecasts are always wrong. No forecast, no matter how much data may be provided, can be 100% accurate. Therefore, supply chains that rely solely on demand forecasting to develop a supply chain strategy risk fluctuations in inventory relative to the amount of variation in the forecast. In some cases, it can be beneficial to work with the customer to have set production levels agreed upon before the product is scheduled. This helps offset much of the risk borne by both the customer and the retailer. Number four, demand is not the only source of supply chain variation. Variation exists in many places within the supply chain. Factors such as delivery lead times, manufacturing lead times, manufacturing yields, logistics transportation times, and demand variety. Number five, actions taken by other entities within the supply chain can increase risk significantly. For example, 
Just-in-time manufacturing requires components to be made available with little or no variation in lead time. This strategy can backfire if the retailer requires a sudden increase in inventory which the manufacturer had not planned for. In this case, efforts to reduce costs in manufacturing increases risks throughout the supply chain and can even increase costs elsewhere. The same is true for strategies such as outsourcing or offshoring in which the supply chain is stretched in order to reduce costs in one area with the risk of failure elsewhere in the supply chain. Number six, costs within the supply chain cannot always be determined in isolation. The more complex the supply chain, the more potential for externalities to occur in which costs are disproportionately felt by others within the supply chain and usually without knowledge by the other entities. Number seven, demand is not felt the same throughout the supply chain. Demand tends to be felt the most by the retailer with different levels of demand felt as one moves down the supply chain. This is a common cause of what is called the bullwhip effect, which we will be covering later in this course. Number eight, Supply chain entities sometimes have different and conflicting objectives. As a result, conflict between supply chain entities is common as each party tries to reduce costs and shift risks by moving it to others within the supply chain. Service supply chains differ from traditional manufacturing supply chains in that products procured by a service supply chain are not provided for the manufacturing of a product but are instead used in the providing of a predefined service. The main difference between the two is that within the supply chain the raw materials and the product is flowed through the supply chain to the customer whereas in a service supply chain the customer is flowed through the chain and products and services are provided to the customer as the customer's demand flows through the supply chain i've created a very simple service systems diagram of a restaurant to illustrate this in which the product offering is defined beforehand this in turn attracts a customer, which in turn starts the chain of processes from greeting the customer all the way to the customer leaving and a feedback mechanism in which the product offering is compared to the customer's wants, needs, and expectations and changes can be made to the product offering and menu and possibly the way the services provided are conducted. In each of these areas, supplies are pulled such that the service provider would function as a type of customer that receives product from a retailer and then modify it for the service provider's customer. In instances where there is no tangible service, such as insurance or baking, resources would be pulled to fulfill the service requirements as defined by the initial design of the product offerings. In this example, the product offerings would be considered similar to the development chain in the traditional manufacturing supply chain example. The key note, as I mentioned earlier, is that the customer is routed through the service supply chain rather than a tangible product itself. The supplies provided by the service supply chain are used to address the customer specific need within the certain process within the service processes which require resources to fulfill. I hope that this video has helped you to understand how supply chains operate as a system. I also hope that my description of a service supply chain relative to a traditional manufacturing supply chain helps you in understanding the key differences between the two. Please feel free to leave any comments in the video and I will gladly reply to them. And also please feel free to look at other videos in my library if you have any questions on any other topics that I may have discussed in this video.